In this episode, I connect the head to the brain by making a custom PCB. In case you're not familiar with it, this Frankendoodle project involves transplanting the open source electronics from my old Solidoodle 2 printer into this normally closed source Zortrax M200. In the last episode, we pulled out the factory Zordrax mainboard and in its place installed an open source RepRap rumber board. We then configured Marlin from scratch and we got as far as getting the stepper motors to move around with some pretty dodgy homing. Well, since then, I've made great progress. Let me talk you through what I've done. The first step was to take the stepper motors from the Solidoodle 2, which are upgrades because they're 0.9 degree steppers compared to the usual 1.8 degree. Installation for them was pretty straightforward, even though they were marginally longer than the factory Zortrax stepper motors. To install each one, two steps were needed. The first was to transplant the factory spacer and the pulley from each one, where I used a small hex key to get the spacing exactly the same. The next step was to lengthen the cables on the new stepper motors so they would comfortably reach the new mainboard underneath. After a really thorough lubrication, the printer was moving again and the steppers were going very smoothly. Great start. Now, if you remember in the last episode, the rumble was just dangling by otherwise underneath the printer. So I thought this was going to be the next thing that I needed to address. My first step was to take some calipers to the Zortrax board and measure all of the mounting holes very accurately. I then retrieved the same measurements from the rumble website and I got to designing in Onshape. I laid out a couple of sketches with each of the measurements, moved one over the other where I wanted them to be, and then made a frame for the Zortrax board with some standoffs to line up with the rumba. This was relatively painless, didn't take too long to print, and I'm glad to say that the parts fitted first go. Now that the rumba was mounted in its final position, I was confident in tidying up some other wiring. One job that needed to be done was extending the end stop cables, and another was remounting the hot end connector so it could go into the screw terminals of the rumba. Now that takes us to the main focus of this episode, which is interfacing the ribbon cable that normally goes from the hot end down to the main board. Now right up here on top of the stepper motor, Zordrax put this little breakout board. Its job is to take the ribbon cable and terminate it to the connectors needed for the stepper motors, fans, etc. I spent some time with the multimeter doing the pinout for it, but then I realized two of the pins weren't working for me. Flipping it to the underside, I saw some bad news. There was an integrated circuit, and as I pulled out what I thought was a thermistor, it ended up being something that looked a lot more like a thermocouple. I was originally hoping that I need to design one breakout board for the ribbon cable down the bottom to distribute everything into the main board, but now I knew I needed to design two because I couldn't use the one on the top either. So I knew that I needed two matching breakout boards, so it was time to hit the computer. In the past, I've designed and made a few PCBs on my router using EagleCAD, but my program of choice this time was Easy EDA. Now I'm going to keep it pretty brief in this one because I'll do a detailed tutorial in future, but these are the basic steps that I followed. The first thing you need to do in Easy EDA is to create a schematic, and to do that, we come to the libraries and we insert parts. If you search for something like a 2x10 connector for the ribbon cable, you'll get things that come up and you can then hit place and put them in position. You then complete the schematic by drawing lines between the things that you need to be connected. After a lot of design changes, this is what I ended up with. I had a terminal block connected to five pins each of the ribbon cable to help all of the current transfer, and then three other connectors that went to thermistors and fans, and finally, a sepal motor connector that went to a pin each. Back to our simple example, and the next step after everything is connected is to say convert to PCB. This will lay out all the physical footprints of each object and you can click and drag them into place wherever you want on the provided surface. You then switch to the bottom layer and then once again connect up everything that needs to join. On my one it was a little bit more complicated than that because I had five pins going to each of these connectors for the hot end. I also had two mounting holes that I measured to match the factory one, and you can see that everything here is drawn quite oversized and fat. So we click on something and then we manually input the widths and the size of the hole that we want to make that as small as possible, and we do the same thing for all of the tracks. These techniques are only applicable for the manufacturing method I'm going to be showcasing in this video. We then come to export, select PDF, and then we want everything merged in black and white, and we only want things like the bottom layer and the document layer, so we only have the outline and the traces. Here is our PDF opened in Adobe Illustrator. Because we're not using Gerber files, we need to do some manual cleanup. 
So all of the pads underneath these large areas can be individually selected and then deleted because we're not going to need them at all. The next thing that we notice is that all of our tracks for the PCB are actually individual lines with a thickness set to them. So what we need to do is select all of them and then use a command in Illustrator that will make them solid. We come up to Edit, Path and Outline Stroke. This traces the outside of them, making them solid areas. As you can see, they're still not connected to the pads, so we still need to use the Pathfinder tool to merge the pads and the traces together. Now the little white dots that are meant to be holes are actually white circles on top of the shape. So we need to select them with the pattern trace underneath and then do subtract mode from Pathfinder. This will turn them into holes and we have to tediously repeat this for every single trace in the drawing. We're going to be manually drilling all of the holes in the PCB. So for now, we want to set them really, really small. Basically, the router is just going to do a little bit in the middle, which is going to act like a center punch to keep our drill bit accurately in place. I tried to add some labels and lettering, but unfortunately my cam program didn't like it at all. I tried converting the text into outlines, but it still didn't recognize it, and I'll have to sort this out before I make my proper tutorial. Now here's a vital step. Because we're machining this to be on the underside, but we're looking from the perspective of the top, we need to select everything and mirror it horizontally so it comes out correctly in the final product. Finally, we export as a DXF, ready to import into our CAM software. For this video, I'm using software called Desproto, which is one of the more affordable options. I import my DXF, which works great apart from the missing text, then I create a vector operation, which I named PCB, and this allows me to delete the default one, which was set up for 3D geometry, and now I'm ready to go. I double click on it, and I can input the settings that I need. I start by setting the spindle speed as fast as it'll go, and then selecting a cutter, which matches my engraving bit that I'll be using for this job. Now we get to the most important step, which is setting the depth that we want the cut, which is minus 0.1 millimeters. We can then come to profiling and select all of the geometry that we've imported ready to be traced with the cutter. We hit apply and then generate toolpath and it will give us a preview of how our cutter will move to cut out the PCB. Looks great, so let's export it and send it to the CNC router. All right, out in the cold, cold garage and I have my piece of copper clad PCB masking tape down to the bed. Now because it's doing such a shallow cut, that is strong enough to hold it, but unfortunately this piece was a little bit old and a little bit warped, so I couldn't get it down flat. What I'm doing here is positioning the starting point of the cutter in the lower left, using very precise movements, and then I'll be ready to start the cut. As you can see, this first one, because it was uneven, did not cut very cleanly at all. It was cutting nicely at the start, but as soon as it moved over to the left areas, which are a little bit lower, it wasn't penetrating the top of the PCB, and this resulted in a failed job that had to be aborted. Fortunately, on the other side of the PCB, things were a lot flatter and I was successfully able to machine my first job for this project. As you can see, the cuts are a little rough, so there's another step that follows. That is getting some sandpaper and sanding back the surface to get rid of any high points and to clean up so you can see all of the traces properly. Later on, we'll still have to get some sort of small knife and go along each trace to make sure there's no bridges with stray bits of copper. Since I had everything set up, I machined another four to give me a total of five PCBs to work with. It's always good to have spares in case you make a mistake later on. That includes drilling, cutting out or soldering. Here I cut out the individual PCBs using this special saw, which is like a jigsaw inverted in a table. Unless you've got a metal band saw, it's probably the ideal tool for doing this. Next run to the linisher to clean up the edges of the PCB. You'll find there's little copper stray areas and these need to be removed and you put a little bit of angle on to bevel the edge to make sure there's no sharp bits that can cut your finger. As you can see, there's not much of the traces left so I probably could have made them even fatter in easy EDA. This is one of the most tedious parts, which is drilling by hand all of the little holes where the through mount components will be mounted. I left the correct set at school so I had to do this with a hand drill. 
I had decided to reuse the factory Zortrax connectors, so this means desoldering them from the little board. I used a soldering iron and a solder sucker to remove the excess solder, and then a little heating up and tugging with the soldering iron to get all of the plugs out. The last job of course is to solder all of the connectors in place and obviously this is not the best soldering I've ever done. The skinny traces are really hard to get my old soldering iron tip into but it's functional and there's no traces that have bridges and everything plugged in perfectly. It's a bit of a rat's nest in here and I'll need to extend my electronics mount to include holders for this little board. All I can really do for now is use the velcro cable ties to keep everything a little bit tidier. A bit of mucking around but ultimately a huge success. Everything fits nicely, even the little factory 3D printed cover fits over the components. You'd never know anything was different underneath. I've tested and made sure all of the fans are working as they should be, and I've heated up the nozzle, which goes a lot faster now, and extruded some plastic successfully. So you might be thinking, why no test print? Well, there's a couple of things that still aren't done. Firstly, the LCD is not mounted, but that's only superficial and not really holding us back. But the main thing is there's no Z end stop. Now, if you recall, we have three of these Zortrax printers. So besides this one that I'm doing myself at home, the other two back at school are being modified by students to have the CTC Pro-B RepRap Electronics fitted as well. Those two are just gonna have a normal micro switch, which means I'll design a little mount for an end stop. But for me, nothing but the best, so I'm fitting a BL Touch. Now you can see, as I was describing in the last video, the Prusa Mark III magnetic bed fits perfectly, so this will complement it very nicely and make this a very high quality printer like it deserves to be with this beautiful frame. In the next episode, we'll get this fitted and that should put us in a position to do our very first prints. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully I'll catch you in the next one. And until then, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.